Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here tonight with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? Just fine, Bruce. How are you doing? All right. All things considered. Yeah. Season's winding down. Season's winding down. And the Edmonton Oilers lose in overtime to the Arizona Coyotes. Hungry pack of coyotes. Yeah. We're going to be apparently... That franchise looks like it's moving to Utah this year, Bruce. I have to say, when I when I saw that news, I just thought, ah, you have it coming. <laughs> I've got a long memory. And I know some people, I guess, are mourning this uh, for some reason. Like, I, you know, maybe if you're Louis DeBrusque and you played in Arizona. And, but right. they stole their team from Winnipeg, so I've got no sympathy for them. They were in Arizona longer than they were in Winnipeg. I mean, even including the WHA years, mm, I think they were they longer were. in Arizona than than Winnipeg. But uh, they were always they usurpers were, to me, Bruce. Always yeah, well, usurpers yeah, to me. and and they were always a, they've always been a drain on the yeah. league in terms of uh, hitting up for the equalization fund, and now somehow their owner that's come in and run the crap show for the last few years is going to walk away with a tidy 600 million profit. Indeed. Bruce, this is our two good things, two bad things, two numbers and one conundrum podcast about tonight's game, which the Oilers lost in overtime. The grade A shots were 17 for the Coyotes, 3 for the 13 for the Oilers, not third, not 3, 13, 17 to 13. And the subset of five alarms were seven to six for the Coyotes. They were the better team by that metric and Mm -hmm. the better team uh, on the scoreboard. Bruce, what's your good thing? Yeah. Yeah, that's a fair, uh, uh, that's a fair assessment. Uh, Oilers had the more shots in this game, but I'm not surprised at all that uh, it added up at the end to be more dangerous shots by Arizona. Uh, My good thing is uh, I'm going to go with Ryan Nugent Hopkins. I thought he had a strong game tonight absolutely nothing to show for it uh offensively uh uh or i mean just zero zero across the board uh but he led the team with in ice time 21 minutes 41 seconds a bit more than we would like to see i think uh led the team in ice time in uh both power play and shorthanded which the penalty kill team was good uh the power play had one whole opportunity one whole opportunity in the in the game and weren't able to connect and the pk had two times to kill and they they were they did a good job i thought on the on the penalty kill uh and even strength uh, i thought nuge was bringing it he had six shots on net nine shot attempts had a couple hits three takeaways like he was all over the puck and there was one sequence in particular in the third period where uh he made a great play in his own end of the ice to uh, end a cycle and get puck going in the right direction. And then he charged up to join the the rush. Leon fed uh, Hyman for a chance, and then Nuge almost cashed the rebound. And then the puck came squirting out of the zone the other way. And who's out in the neutral zone breaking up the attack before it gets anywhere? Nuge and Hopkins. Same sequence. Good play in the D zone, the O zone, and the neutral zone, right in a row. And so that caught my eye, and I. On a night that a lot of Oilers really didn't. Yeah, um, I again I like Nugent Hopkins and Drysaddle together. I think mm-hmm. that's an interesting combination. And um, we'll see when McDavid gets back if maybe they stick with that because those guys are uh, working fairly well together at even strength. That line did create a number of great A shots yeah. at even strength, even though they didn't score. Uh, so, Bruce, my good thing was I, um, this line struggled at times defensively. The line of Evander Kane, Adam Henrique, and Warren Fogel. But they um, they had two sequences, um, one in the first period and then one in the uh, second period where they where they scored a goal. And in the first period, it was the Oilers' first uh, grade-A shot in net, on net. Um, it was a, a face-off play. 
and Henrik won the face off. I think it was um, uh, pass over either Kulak or Stetcher to DeHarnay, who put it deep. And then Fogel centered the puck to Evander Kane, who had two incredible chances in the first period uh, in this in this sequence. Bang, bang. I think they both, uh, one hit the post, one hit the crossbar. And um, that was nice. And then uh, early in the second period, with the orders down, one nothing, they tied the game. And um, this was Evander Kane um, making a nice play, winning the puck, getting the puck, making a nice backhand, hard backhander on net, and, and um, Henrik putting in the rebound. Just a excellent play. Uh, actually, the, 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 there was initially a, a slot shot from Henrik, and then Kane won it, and then uh, that's when um, he put it on net and Henrik put it in. So in that sequence, Henrik had two grade A shots, two five alarm shots in that same sequence. So that line was looking good at that moment, Bruce. I thought they might be my good thing for the game. And mm -hmm. it's an interesting line. I think they're, I think it's a possibility. Um, Henrik isn't the fastest player. So he needs to play with fast players. And Fogel is that. And um, Kane is not slow. He can be fast. He's fast going forward. <laughs> we'll say that diplomatically. And um, so it's, you know, it's got some power. It's got some skill. And, and Henry was in his best game, that's for sure. But he can, I think, play smart defensive hockey. He's cut out, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But um, he, um, that, that line is a possibility, like in terms of what they might do. Um, of course, when McDavid comes back, they're going to have to slide out one player from the top six. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, that could be Kane. It could be Henrik. We'll see who gets uh, put on the third line. But... Um, yeah, the orders, I mean, it, it, there's some interest, you know, McDavid being out um, two games here. They've gotten three points out of the two games. They And they've tried some different line combinations that I think have been kind of interesting, both this one and the dress out of line. So hasn't been a total disaster. Nope, not total. <laughs> <laughs> What's your bad thing, Bruce? Yeah, well, it's basically uh, coverage by the forwards uh, on the on the rush, and the uh, first like the first two like the two regulation goals by Arizona both came off of three on two rushes where the two D men were left to their own devices by the three forwards. Now, on the first one, one of those D men, Evan Bouchard, did not help his own cause by directly passing the puck to Arizona. With yeah, a breakout pass, uh, I don't know who it was intended to, but it went right to the Arizona guy and came, just sort of hit, like it hit a backboard, came right back through the neutral zone, and all three Oilers forwards were trapped. And uh, one of them, Dylan Holloway, came back hard, but didn't know what to do, frankly. Like he had a guy to pick up there in the slot, and instead he sort of got into puck watching and he skated too deep and the puck bounced to the guy that he, well, could have been covering, and he, you know, he went down, tried to block the shot. Well, that didn't help. Uh, I mean, he tried, but it didn't end well. Uh, and it was just a case of Oilers being outnumbered. And then the second goal uh, was the same thing. Like, there was a, a battle along the wall, and uh, this was the fogel Henry kane line. Kane went down low below the goal line. I don't think he did a thing wrong. And Fogel got into a one-on-one -on -one battle on the wall. And Henrik went up the boards behind him towards the icing line. And when Fogel lost the battle, there was no forwards left. And it was just a wide-open three-on-two from, from like the hash marks in, in Arizona's territory. By the time they hit the blue line, David, all three of those Arizona forwards were hitting the blue line, and there was no Oilers forward even at center. That's how wide open the three-on-two was. And even at that, their D-man, Dursey, who had a good game, he activated, and he took a pass, and it was his shot that was kind of ping-ponged around, and, you know, the rebound was wrapped out of the air. And You can say that it was... Uh, you know, the D-men didn't do their job, but for sure the forwards 
didn't do their job. And I would, on that particular play, single out Adam Henrique for being in the wrong spot. The puck support play there uh, for a safe, conscientious defense first team like the Oilers are trying to be is above the puck. And he was below the puck. Yeah, uh, the puck went south, and he never caught up. When you're when you're playing the center position, you want to play it like the 34 year old Sam Gagne, not the 20 year old Sam Gagne. Right. And Henrik played that as a 20 year old. Sam Gagne was on the wrong side of the scrum almost every single the time, hoping the puck would squirt loose <laughs> so he could get it and charge on net with the puck. It was just it was just again and again and again. But in the second incarnation, or this third that we've seen of Gagne with the orders, he's on the right side of the puck almost mm-hmm. always. So he's, he's behind, as you say, behind the puck. So if Warren Fogel mm-hmm. loses the puck, as is going to happen Once to more. players in board battles, um, you're there mm-hmm. to stop it. And Henrik just skated on by and was on the wrong side of the puck. And so for a smart veteran player, that didn't come close to meeting the standard. Um, the Holloway was taken was more like, again, a 20-year-old Sam Gagne. Like, yeah. <laughs> but it was if, a 20-year-old like, mistake. There was. There was a huge, you know, Holloway had a really good game um, in his first game back. He, he was rushing around doing things, mm-hmm. making a lot of noise, scored a goal, big hit. And, um, you know, there's a lot of people who really, really like this player and um, think he should be playing in the lineup, maybe even higher up the lineup. And I, I don't, honestly, Bruce, I don't see it. Like, this kind of mistake, like all due respect to the player who has tremendous potential and can really fly and make plays, but too many defensive mistakes like this. And until he cuts out this kind of mistake, if he mm-hmm. makes that play, like the veteran player, the veteran move is you don't watch the puck. You're looking for the danger man creeping into the slot and you take him. Right. And if you do that, there's nothing bad happens. But the young player puck watches. The offensive-minded player puck watches. And mm-hmm. that's what he did. And doesn't take the man. And there's a goal scored because of it, in large part. So, um, like, again, there's nothing, like, Dylan Holloway has all kinds of potential as a hockey player. But if he's not in the lineup on an opening day of the playoffs, it will be plays like that that, that are the reason. Oh, yeah. And... Um, and that's giving all due respect to the amount of talent mm-hmm. that he has as a player and potentially as a, as a player. But I would not be playing him again ahead of Ryan, Yanmark, or Brown. And I know some people would they'll scream when they hear that. They can't believe anyone would say that. But that's what, it's what I, you know, we break down the grade A shots for and against. We're doing it for a reason. So we on so on the most crucial plays, we know who's doing their job and who isn't doing their job. And I can assure you, Jan Mark and Brown do their job far more often on the in the defensive end than Holloway. And on the attack, they're just about as good right now because again, he doesn't quite connect all the time with his with his line mates. So um, and Corey Perry's not coming out of the lineup. Like, you know, I think you can make an argument to put in Holloway over Corey Perry. Like I wouldn't think that's crazy, personally. Um, although I like Corey Perry as a player as well, but I don't think that's going to happen either. Yeah, well, if Holloway's to get into the lineup once McDavid is back, to keep him in the lineup, they'll have to bench one of their low forwards. Now, I mean, you could make the case after tonight's game if you're going to say, well, we're going to dump on Holloway for, you know, poor coverage on the first goal. Well, we can dump on and already have dump on Henrik <laughs> for poor coverage on the second goal. And you're about to dump on him for poor coverage on the third goal, I think. Yeah. And it, <laughs> he's and not so, coming out of the line. Yeah, so. but he's not coming out of the line. He's got five goals already. I mean, Dylan yeah. Holloway has played 34 games this year and he's got four goals and one assist. So defensive mistakes sort of stand out, you know, if you're putting the puck in the net regularly, you know, defensive mistakes are, you know, to some degree, they're a cost of doing business that you have to be prepared to pay. But when you don't, uh, so anyway, Dylan Holloway, he had six hits in this game and he was noticeable, but he was most noticeable when he almost got his head taken off in the first period check that uh, that guy's got to learn to protect himself or he's not going to have a long career. Fair enough, and and we're and, and of course we're both 
rooting for him. We oh, want yeah. him to do well, but we're just trying to call him. I don't want to see him get his head taken off. Yeah, exactly. The so late, great Scott Young uh, once wrote, you skate around with your head down, you'll soon wind up with no head at all in this league. <laughs> um, Adam Henrique, uh, I'm not sure that I would pick him in overtime, honestly. It's a no, skating game. Choice. It's a skating game. And I mean, I, that's when he might even play Dylan Holloway. I mean, that guy flies and um, he can defend. It's the, the defending is a little simpler in some ways because there's three guys out there all and you just take one of them. Yeah, yeah, it's all man to man. So anyway, they went with Henrique and um, uh, my bad thing is the entire overtime because it starts out with um, 30 seconds in a Phoenix rush. And um, two veteran players, Nurse and Nugent Hopkins, turned a two-on-two into two absolute howler of, howlers of scoring chances for Arizona. Mm-hmm. You know, one a pass across, cross-seam pass that Nugent's, Nurse doesn't cut out, and Ner- Nugent Hopkins is slow getting to the shooter. It's deep to the net, yeah. And then there's a big rebound, and the guy there's a guy left wide open in front of the net. Um, Nurse can't cut out the pass, and Nugent's way out of position. So two five alarm shots that it could easily have settled the game right there, and two veteran players on a two on two, they just didn't get it done. And then another minute later, another veteran player. Um, it's not a very dangerous situation in the Oilers' zone. Matthias Michelli of uh, the Coyotes, he gets the puck high in the offensive zone, and um, Henrique is just way too much gap, way too much gap. Now he's a, he is a center isolated with a tricky forward, um, trying to be the defender. So it's a tough position for um, a centerman, like a a forward, to defend a a high-octane offensive player. But he didn't come close. He gave Michelli all the the time in the world. Michelli kind of angled across the top of the slot and shot across his body back the other direction, and it fooled Calvin Pickard, who up until that point, Calvin Pickard had been outstanding that game. I thought he was um, played a really strong game. That that goal was somewhat iffy. We're, you think it's probably we would count it as a grade A shot because he had it was from the it was it was from the high outer slot, but he had all times all kinds of time to pick his spot. And you let a, any kind of like that guy can just put the puck where he wants it, and he certainly did on that goal because Henrik just gave him all the time and space in the world on that shot by NHL standards. Yeah. Well, I'm going to fill in a little bit of the gaps in there too, David. Let's start with the very beginning of overtime when uh, linesman uh, kicks dry saddle out of the face off dot to start the overtime for what seemed like the 15th time in the game. These linesmen, man, drop the puck. Anyway, uh, so Nuge came in, lost that draw, and then that led to those two chances that Arizona had full possession right from the Right yeah. from the drop. Uh, anyway, after the two saves, there was a great chance the other way where Nuge chipped it up the boards to Leon. looked like he had a partial breakaway, and he kind of held back. And instead of firing a shot on goal, he made a hard pass to Nurse across the face of goal that wound up in the corner. Yet another order's odd man rush that wound up without a shot. A real pet peeve of mine. And this one cost him the hockey game. I mean, Leon had the game on a stick there. You know, a 40-goal man, shoot it into the damn net, man. You know, like you got a partial <laughs> breakaway. Just take it to the net. Shoot. I like yeah. your chances. And he looked it off and nothing. So, and he had a pretty good game, you know, but shooting wasn't a big part of it. He only had two shots. So, Bruce, what's your number? Oh, yeah, I had a number. Uh you go first. Just All right. Uh, the orders uh, in this game won uh, um, 36 out of 55 face-offs. They're absolutely mm-hmm. dominant, 65%. Derek Ryan was 8-1. and one. Mm-hmm. Um, Adam Henrique, 7-4. and four, And Leon Dreisaitl, 13-5. And, and my number is actually um, fifth, heading, heading into the game at least. The orders were fifth overall in face-off wins in the NHL as a team, 52.8% of their face-offs they've won. Number one is Pittsburgh at 55.6. Uh, wow. 
So the Oilers are and oh. in their conference. There's only one team, Bruce, that's better than them, the Dallas Stars at 53.9, who are going to be on the other side of the draw, initially at least. So um, the, uh, the Oilers used to be, in the decade of darkness, this was a constant drumbeat, constant issue, and even in McDavid's early years. But this year, individually, um, the Oilers are all, and this is before the game, because the NHL, I don't think, has updated this. Let me just refresh and see if they have updated it by now i don't think they still have, have. Uh, they still, still have, have it. it they take so long to update their numbers after a game yeah. it's like uh, they haven't heard of computers yeah. well their uh, face-off win percentage would have gone up for right? a lot of I, the players I wouldn't have caught new jersey in fourth no you know you'd have to you know because they're they're almost one full percent behind them yeah. It's cool. Top five is good. So dry sidle yeah. is at um on the season 56.8% mm -hmm. for his face offs. He's always been good. Yeah. This year, Connor McDavid's at 51.3, which is really good for him. Ryan McLeod is at 49.9. Uh Nugent Hopkins 48. Derek Ryan 50 uh 54.8. Adam Henrique as an oiler, 58.7, and Sam Carrick, 58.4. So this is really, you know, I, I do, I'm, I'm in the camp that says face-offs are an overrated statistic. There's a lot of focus on them, a lot of discussion about them. I think it's, it's, a, it's a fact that you can measure it. It's, it, it's yeah. a battle that you can easily measure, so it's measured. So there's a lot of focus on it. Whereas you, board battles, for instance, they don't, you, you, there's no stat, like he's won 57% of his board battles. That would be in some ways, it's harder to measure. It's more subjective, so that's why it's not measured um, by the NHL. Um, officially, it would be a more um, pertinent stat to a player's value. But face-offs are one battle. They're important battles, and the Oilers are really doing well at them this year, which is good news for the team. Your number, Bruce. Yeah. Uh, I'll go with 102, uh, which is now Oilers' points total. And the fact that they gained one point tonight has actually sealed uh, home ice advantage in the first round of the playoffs. They needed one more point to uh, get that Good. job done. Uh, they, also, they also needed one point to at least keep their Pacific Division fate in their own hands. They had one point to give and they gave it tonight. Uh, but if they can beat Vancouver in overtime and then win out, or simply match Vancouver the rest of the way. Uh, they are uh, uh, they're able to uh, um, finish first in the Pacific. Still, so, even yeah. even with that. Yeah, because they have one more game left in Vancouver, and they have this head to head, and they're three points back of them. So. Yeah, so the Oilers sure. can get um, eight more points. They can finish with uh, yeah. one hundred and ten. And Thank Vancouver you know. can finish with at most they've got. Well, they could finish with a, if they. Oh, it depends if yeah you're. It yeah, depends. They got to win. Beat them. They got to beat Vancouver. So well, that's interesting. And I think Oilers will have something left in the tank for Vancouver tomorrow night. In the tonight's game, I was very concerned it would be a trap game, and I would say that that's exactly what it turned out to be. You know, they turned it up for a while in the game, but they were never. You know, never got the lead, and uh, Arizona spent way too much time in Edmonton's end in the first part of the game, and then the last ten minutes of the third period was like, let's get moving here, and it was uh, 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 just not a game that they uh, were able to finish off. It's typical Oilers kind of game um, since their winning streak, since they you know poured it on. To get back in the season you know they, they have lots of games where they're just playing well enough to hang in there and you Even know you gotta win streak, but they win them yeah yeah and they almost eked out a win here so yeah, Bruce, well, i think they're um, 10 0 and 2 in their last 12 home games pretty good so that's not since since they lost to calgary on the hockey night in canada they beat la st louis pittsburgh washington Lost in overtime to Colorado, beat Montreal in overtime, beat Buffalo, L.A., Anaheim, Colorado, Vegas, 
and then lost in overtime tonight. And by big scores, like they have a, you know, they've been outscoring teams by significant margin over uh, over that uh, uh, twelve game run. So you take your point and you say maybe that's all we deserve tonight, but at least we've got something. Let's move on. Bruce, on to the conundrum. And the conundrum tonight is Mark Stone of Las Vegas, WTF. Mm-hmm. What the Friday is going on there, man? Same as it ever was. Same as it ever was. Same Bruce, as it ever was. I'm left. Um, <laughs> I just think this is completely. There's a couple of funny things. I, I remember when the, when Stone first got out there, there seemed to be this kind of in, incredible um, kind of na- is naive the right word response from a lot of NHL writers. Like, well, he's got a lacerated spleen. Of course he's out. Like, what are you mm-hmm. guys complaining about? Just shut up. Like, mm-hmm. man, what's wrong with you? Like, and I thought, S- really seriously, you Seen you believe X-ray? this? <laughs> This system is set up. This system is absolutely set up to cheat. There's 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 limited transparency, limited accountability. There's there's okay. There's no transparency from a fan's point of view. We have no idea right now. There's not one fan on earth who can say with certainty whether he had a miraculously healing. He had a terrible lacerated spleen or not. Nobody knows. Now, is there? Do they know at the NHL? If they're not telling their fans, so that's one thing. Probably not. Do they have accountability at the NHL level? We have even no idea of that. We have no idea what their process is, um, what the NHL can do to check. They're not telling anybody. They don't make it clear that they check. There's just It's just a complete unknown. Again, so this is a system set up where you are guaranteed to have massive cheating. And we are, I, I think, you know, we can't, we can't say for sure, but certainly looks that way to me like there's been mass this is massive cheating and there's been massive cheating in other years again you, i can't say for sure but that's how this looks and there's no other way to, to slice it and and there wasn't from the moment stone went out with the lacerated lacerated spleen there was no way to know and that's what the every nhl writer should have said there is no way to know if they're gaming the system or not and instead they were kind of snarky about it like oh well this you know you fans what do you know anyway so there's that to, to fix this, then they've got to fix this. Um, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know what, what they can do with the cap or anything like that, but they, they, at the very least, they've got to have more transparency and more accountability and, a, and an open process at the NHL of reviewing this. They should have an investigation right now of loss. The NHL should say, we're having an investigation of this and we are going to report on it to the fans. So they know what's happening here. Good luck and with that. they're not going to do that, but, Again, 100% guaranteed cheating, and and it's you're almost like you're almost foolish if you don't because that's the way the system is set up. Yeah, well, I've seen folks out there complimenting uh, Kelly McCrimmon there and and uh, Vegas for his ruthlessness, and I've even seen people criticizing Ken Holland for never taking advantage of the rules like this. So I'm thinking, well, what's Holland supposed to do? Hire Jeff Galuli to go out and kneecap Drysaddle and put him out for two months just before the trade deadline, or what? I mean, our team is healthy. It's hard to game LTIR when your team is healthy. So that's worked to Edmonton's advantage for much of the season. But now you get to the deadline where Vegas – with their magical new calf space, have gone out and acquired Hannafin and Hurdle, uh, Hurdle, uh, Hurdle, and also uh, the big guy from Washington, Mantha. Three, three guys, three guys. They were all in the lineup for him the other night. Now if Stone comes back to the playoffs uh, for Game One, just like he did last year. Same player did it. You know, it's like they're going to have. $90 million team against all the other $80 million teams. And it's gotten old. It is. You know, isn't Chicago it? did it. Tampa did it. Vegas did it. It looks like Vegas is doing it again. So maybe they just need one Canadian team to try it. And then it'll be Edmonton forfeiting a third round pick to Calgary and it'll be done with it forever. It's interesting because because <laughs> it, 
it, it tends to happen with older players, right? Like, because they're all kind of banged up and nursing, nursing some mm-hmm. chronic injury that they're often playing with anyway. So, you know, in years to come, the owners are going to, the owners are getting older, Hyman, Nugent Hopkins, Nurse, they're all on long-term contracts. You could see one of them where it would be like, yeah, maybe a couple months off before the playoffs would actually be just what the, the doctor ordered, so to speak. And it would benefit the Oilers, but you can count on it, Bruce. Just when it's going to benefit the Oilers, That's it will go away. It will go away. <laughs> They'll figure it out. Anyway, it's ridiculous. And they de- they're yeah. getting all kinds of scorn, and they, they deserve it. it. Yeah, it doesn't look good, and it doesn't smell good. I mean, it may be that, you know, they sent Mark Stone off to some monastery in the Himal- Himalayas, and there was a laying on of hands, and somehow his... Uh, Hot rocks. His... <laughs> His lacerated <laughs> spleen unlacerated itself. Yeah. I mean, they were saying that's a three to six month injury. Well, I got news for you. It was less than two months ago that he suffered it. And he was seen on the golf course last week and on the practice ice today. Non-contact jersey and maybe he still, you know, comes back for game two instead of game one. But it sure doesn't doesn't smell good. It does not. Bruce, let's leave it there tonight. you got to go write the game grades, and we're going to be back at this sure. tomorrow night. So, all righty. <laughs> thanks for talking tonight, Bruce. Yeah, thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast. <laughs>